you back to our, our series, Expert at Home. And I am really excited to have with me today uh, two uh, very impressive uh, women, Dr. Nicole Kamak, if I say it right, and Dr. Danielle Busby. Uh, they are both from uh, Black Mental Wellness. Uh, they have a really interesting website and are both clinicians as well. And I'm really excited to talk to both of you today. Uh, so thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having Thank us. You for having I'm really uh, excited about this conversation. And uh, so uh, I want to start off by saying, uh, asking you, um, you know, we are in the middle of two crises going on, uh, both with what's going on with COVID-19, which is affecting us uh, all over the world, and also with uh, the racial justice issues really coming to the fore um, in our country, but actually around the world as well. Um, and uh, I was just uh, wondering what both of you are seeing, how you're dealing with that personally, but also how you're, what you're seeing with the people that you work with. So I feel like you're right. There are two really big pandemics that are happening right now. And you know, while COVID-19 is a really big pandemic that has really produced a lot of stress in a lot of ways for myself and others, I think the for the, the increased attention that's been given to racial injustice in this country, I wouldn't say that that's a new pandemic or a new situation that we're dealing with, but I think that it happening in the midst of COVID-19 has just really magnified its impact, right? And magnified the additional stress that we're, we're all really feeling. And so, I mean, I think for many people, it's a lot of, we were talking about this earlier, it's a lot of the unknown um, as it relates to COVID-19. I think we really all have got, have had to get more comfortable with sitting in the gray and kind of having to make decisions uh, as we get more information and as we get more details about the current state of just the health outcomes in our in our you know designated spaces. But then I also think when we think about the increased attention to the racial injustice, I think it's really, you know, it's increased stress for me as well because it's a patient population and a group of people that I'm a part of and that I'm very passionate about and care a ton about. Uh, and so I think it's hard to see the you know initial stress of dealing with COVID-19 and now having to see people really struggle with the additional trauma of you know witnessing uh, some of the videos that have been posted, knowledge of, you know, continued violence, and just generally having to to manage all those things together has been really tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the therapy room, I guess you're seeing like a lot of the same things, but then things are also being amplified. So um, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, like a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm okay now. I don't need, you know, it's okay. I don't have to worry about teletherapy. Um, as things started to progress and as it started to impact their lives even more. So you're thinking about the stress of being home, adjusting to being in that same space with your partner, being at home with your children for that amount of time and trying to homeschool and balance working, um, thinking about the fear of the grocery store and health and all of these things that were coming up. Even that fear, like people having and knowing someone who had COVID-19 and that fear of, are they going to be okay? Those were a lot of those stressors that happened in the beginning. And again, as you said, Danielle, that fear of the unknown, right? And then as these racial injustices were being um, broadcasted on TV, like these are experiences that people have and they have them day to day or whatever their experiences may be, but being able to see it and to see it all the time, it for a lot of people, it triggered either personal experiences that they had, um, it triggered experiences that they know that their friends or family had, it created fear about the safety of themselves or their family members. Um, and it, it was interesting because even general, in a, I'm sorry, even through the generations, right, you're seeing how this is impacting people. So I work with veterans and a lot of them said, I feel like I'm in the 60s again. I thought things had gotten better. And so those are some of the things that people are currently working through in therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing some of those actual same things. I mean, you know, dealing with the uncertainty, first of all, you know, nobody knows exactly how this is going to play out or what's going to happen, um, how it ends, for sure. We don't know. <laughs> you know, what we thought was a, maybe a month or two is now indefinite um as far as i can see 
Um, and also, you know, I saw that stressing a lot of people. And for some people, you know, um, just the stress of the fear for themselves, but then also, like you said, living at home with spouses, with children coming home, with sometimes multi-generational families. Yes. So you're afraid and wanting to protect, you know, people who are more vulnerable than yourself. Um, you know, so just a lots of fears. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. Um, I sometimes make the analogy in treatment about if you're dealing with a particular stressor um, and if you think about it like holding weight, like if you were holding, I don't know, bricks, for example, right? If I hold two bricks in my hand for one minute, that's going to feel one way. But if I hold them for 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, a year, two years, 200 years, as we just think about all the time that the continuation of the additional stresses are happening, I think that's really important to consider too, because I feel what I'm seeing with my patients and my families that come in is this fatigue, right? Like we've been kind of managing and we've been trying to figure it out and we've been doing the work from home and, you know, getting creative with our spaces, all those things. But I think after doing that for so long, it can just be really taxing, right? And if we add the additional layer, or I wouldn't even say add for some people, but if we just hold it next to it and include it, because it's been, you know, people's experiences for so long, I think there can also be not just fatigue, but a sense of hopelessness sometimes because we've been talking about the same things for years. We've been knowing some of the same data for years. We know that there, um, you know, when we look at the black community specifically, there's disproportionate rates and higher rates of certain illnesses in our community. And we're seeing that come through as it relates to um, COVID as well, right? Like we see that in that space too. And I think knowing that we've known these things that have existed for so long and we haven't always seen that systematic change or intentionality to trying to make that change can really be discouraging. Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, Nicole, too, people thinking things maybe were better, but they're not. And the videos, I think, make it just so much more impactful. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's sort of like, I have, you know, like you can think about both sides with the videos, right? Because there is this part that these videos just highlight what people have been like screaming has been happening. And it's like you're having the proof. And that we've had videos before. But I think in the case of George Floyd, that video from beginning, you know, the surveillance camera that showed how he initially was complying, all of those pieces of it and just the amount of time is like that video is which, what helped this catalyst happen of this moment, right? So we need the video, we need to document so that people can be held accountable, or at least you can get it out because we don't know what will happen, which is a whole other stressor that people in the black community are dealing with. Like, we've been here before and they don't get charged or they, you know, the charges happen, but they don't get convicted. Um, but then the other part of the video is that watching the death and the murder of a black person over and over and over again, and just thinking psychologically what that does to you, what that does to, how you feel about yourself, how you feel in the world, how you feel about your safety in the world, um, your concerns, you see the anxiety going up because realistically that we can't say that 100% this will never happen again. And so those are the things that you start to see and then it's, it's replayed over and over and it's like, oh, we have a different angle or here's another case. And there's like all of these videos that come out and again, we need them for documentation and so that forward movement can happen. But the other side of that is what does it do to you? So I strong, I personally will not watch a black person being murdered. Like it just, I know that it's not healthy for me. I know that I can't let it go. And you know, it's gonna stick with me and I don't need to see the process to know the outcome and to still have that same type of rage. And so my recommendation often to people and I especially um, reiterate it over and over now is be mindful of what you take in. That at any moment you have the power and the control to unplug. You can make a decision not to watch it. You can make a decision to, you know, be careful about when you're watching the news, what news channels you're watching, if you get on social media or not, because it's everywhere. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I just want to echo much of what um, Nicole said and that I agree. I think that intake is so important. And I vow 
from many videos ago to also stop watching them because it did send me into a space that I, you know, it only increased the hopelessness. It only made me more frustrated. And that that knowing of the outcome before you even see the process, yeah, you know, they can really bring you down in moments where you need to, well, you know, look at the work we do. Like we're charged with helping people manage a ton of different problems, right? Including some of their own fears about safety. And I think the point of, we can't ever say that this won't ever happen again. And we have to be conscious that this is a very real fear that people experience. And I think for me, um, I realized just even how physiologically it can impact your body and in your mood, right? So uh, this had to be when I was living in North Carolina. This was my first time living in the South. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. And my father is originally from Yazoo City, Mississippi. So I was very clear on distinctive differences between the North and South, particularly during the time he grew up. And just what the historical context is or, you know, was slash is for Black people in this country. And so I think having that knowledge can you know it can be helpful in preparing me for certain things but it also can induce you know additional fears and i think just seeing a police car after one of the many people who um, had had an encounter with the police that ended in their death made me really nervous i remember having to pull over to the side of the road because my heart was beating really fast and i think the reality that you know no degree no experience you've had or you know, people you know is going to change that you could have this, I could have this very same experience as uh, many of the people that we we witnessed in the news. And that knowledge of how that impacts your body physically is important because it's going to also impact you mentally, right? So those things are really tied in together. And so me being able to notice it was happening in my body made me be more intentional about what am I intaking? How am I allowing this to get creep into my thoughts on such a regular basis? And I try to encourage my patients and my families to consider those things too. Yeah, I like that idea of thinking about being intentional about what you take in and how it's going to impact you. Um, and thinking about, you know, when do you what do you what do you need to see to understand a situation and what, like you said, you know the outcome. It's not helpful and it's just, you know, kind of a torturous experience mm -hmm. that you don't need. Yeah. And I think it's so easy to get so activated by all of those things, you know, and, and especially I think for people who've had their own personal experiences and, and trauma that that I wonder if you're seeing that with people you work with, too, that are, you know, been getting triggered by the material itself that's so prevalent in our social media and our news and everywhere you turn. Mm -hmm. It's definitely coming up. Um... It's, it's just, yeah, so it's coming up, in fact, um, at the VA Medical Center that I work with, and right before this um, meeting today with you all, we were having, we started a race-based stress and trauma group, and it was a group that we were scheduled to start in April. April 9th, we worked hard because we started it in one clinic and it was such a success and it was like, let's apply it in multiple clinics because this is something that our veterans are facing both and that they have faced both in the military and in their civilian life. Um, and COVID-19 happened and we canceled the group because, you know, and then when this happened, it was one of those things where it's like, this is coming up in every single session. Um, all providers are starting to see this with the people that they're working with. How can we quickly meet this need? And really having this race-based stress and trauma group was a way of like, okay, we need to get it back or get it up and running. And so one of the things that it does is it's just like, even if there were experiences that maybe people had suppressed, or a lot of times I feel like, you know, it's not just those big events that happens. It's the daily microaggressions. It's the having to explain yourself in a space, to explain your being, to explain your hair, your color, your background, um, or to feel like you can't fully be yourself in spaces because you're always being mindful of how people are judging you or how they've treated you. Um, how they may have treated you differently because of your race or where you're from and all of these pieces. And then when things like this happen, it amplifies all of that. So it's not just that I had this one traumatic event or experience with the police. It's like, here we go again. 
this and and then it just brings about all of these experiences and then what also happens is now people are walking around even more aware more present in what's happening in our society and feeling less safe outside of here so people are looking for how do i even create that safety because you don't know you don't know and so a lot in therapy is like Sometimes you just have to sit there and you have to create that space in the therapy room. And the hard part is for some of the issues that we're dealing with, there isn't an easy fix, right? There's nothing that it's like we have to act from multiple ways to even address this problem. And so there isn't a quick fix. So how do you help people just to cope and get through this moment? Yeah. I, I thought about you work with veterans and, you know, it's one thing for veterans to come home from a, a war situation and, okay, we're not at war anymore, but at home, even though that feels a hard transition too, right? But, you know, how about this is still going on? Yeah. And you're still in danger. Right. And that's exactly what's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's even a, you know, more visceral thing, I think, for people and, you know, at least it sounds like that group does provide people a sense of safety in that situation to right. at least address those issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's important. And I think that speaks to why it's important to um, have people in spaces that are comfortable talking about race and trauma and you know different experiences and identities and how do they all intersect because they're all, that's all gonna impact whatever comes up in that space, right? And that you need to be able to sit there and no matter how comfortable or uncomfortable it is and be there with them and help people to create some places of trust, space, of safety where they can process those things. And so I think that um, a lot of times people may not um, feel comfortable bringing up race or issues related to race or you know identities or culture in the therapy room and i feel like that's a huge disservice because everything every person who walks in that office is being um you're seeing the result of all of these different experiences right so how i speak to my depression how i experience my depression how i communicate that to you how i'm going to be able to carry out this work from the therapy room to my outside life is all going to be under the umbrella of these identities these you know beliefs my gender my ses like it's all going to impact me because you're going to have to help me figure out how do i even um navigate this within those systems and if we only say well you're here for depression let's just focus on the depression let's just focus on the anxiety then are you considering the environment they're going out to are you considering what it's like to work and are these environments sort of contributing to and sustaining that depressive state that anxious state re-triggering their trauma and so we really have to as providers it is our duty to educate ourselves and even even as a black woman it's not like i'm just like oh i know exactly what to do i don't always know what to do but i am intentional about taking trainings expanding my knowledge so that when i'm in the room i've at least done my due diligence i feel to step in that room and to see that person mm -hmm. i think that's so important what you're saying because it isn't one perspective you know or i know because I had this experience or that experience it's what's my clients experience what do they experience you know what is it like for them and how is it different and mm -hmm. can we make room for them to talk about that yes i would just add i would just add to that in regards to not just the client and in the therapy room that's definitely a a, a place that we want to be thoughtful about how does culture how does race how does identity show up in this space right but then also, depending on where your work environment is as a provider, I think it's also important for us to think about what is the systems in which we work in. And I mean, and that's if you're a provider or if you're working in a corporation, like what systems are we working in? And how do these systems that I, I, I work in every day, how do those perpetuate certain outcomes, even just with, on, a, on a very uh, basic level here? Like do the people that I work with, are they from diverse backgrounds? Do we, are we intentional about efforts and, and trainings and experiences to allow for the people that we work with to have a clear understanding of multiple identities and multiple cultures are we being thoughtful about that are we being intentional about that even in the, the client population we serve as a provider i'm looking at 
Are we doing our best to eliminate barriers to care that we know disproportionately impact certain groups compared to others? Because these are the more found, like while all of it is important foundationally, if we don't have systems that support these ideas and these ways of thinking and these changes, well, each individual doing those things is important, but wow, if those individuals could bound together to change the system they live in and work in, that could be even more powerful. Yeah. Right, right. And and Nicole, you're working in the VA system, right? Is that so? That's one system that has different layers to it, you know. And and you're working in a hospital setting. Um, I'm in a children's hospital. Children's hospital that also has different layers than, you know. Yeah, but we think about schools, we think about universities, we think about corporations, we think. I mean, there's so many systems, right? That we all could be doing something to think about how do we. Uh, really move our work no matter what that work is in the direction of equity like for everyone and you know wellness within a space right yeah. and i think that that those are the conversations that i feel feel like they feel a little different this time right because people are like oh this is the first time we've ever been here and it's like no we had these same protest, you know, you can think just recently with Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin, and you can just keep going back. And it's like, it was the same thing. What does feel different is that one, I feel like allies have stepped up and said, how do we support? Like, this is enough. But I also feel, at least from a professional standpoint, that the conversation has now moved from this Band-Aid is no longer enough. So if we're going to make change, if we're going to think about all of this, then we need to think about it from a systems perspective. How do we, you know, and I'm just using psychology because I'm a psychologist, right? But I'll expand it. Um, but in psychology, it's like, how do we make sure one that is not, you know, we have these diversity work groups and um, committees. Let's make sure that the diversity work groups are really not just the place for the people who uh, fit these categories, but that everyone is a part of that group and that everyone is doing the work, that we're bringing in staff that reflect the people that we're working with and that have diverse education and background so that they can bring that expertise into the therapy room, that we're looking at our hiring practices and looking at leadership and is it diverse at that level, that we're thinking about how do we support the staff who is also having these experiences and going to the therapy room and dealing with it. And that's just within psychology, right? But if we think about that in other areas, like businesses having to really look at their boards and say, is it diverse enough? Um, how do we attend to these different issues? I feel like that's a different space than where we've been. So those are like the pieces of hope that I hold on to because it's like those, all of those, what people may think is like, oh, this is just one little step, but all of those little things add up. And so those little things, the same way we think about how the trauma is being compounded by each experience, all of these things to offset that can also be compounded and create a greater change. And so it's almost impossible to think about black mental health and wellness without thinking about how do we change all of these systems that are negatively impacting black mental health and wellness. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really, you know, coming across your website, I was really impressed with your mission about, you know, I think in general, as mental health practitioners, we come across stigma around mental health. I mean, it's just all over. I do a lot of work in suicide prevention. There's just a lot of stigma. Right. And um, as consumers make us aware and, mm -hmm. you know, in in the suicide field, it's so important to talk to attempt survivors and people who've been there um, and bring them into the conversation and give them as much weight as the professionals in the conversation that they're not there as just some kind of, you know, to provide a little information. They're there as just equal members of those um, groups. But I think that um, in mental health in general, we have a diversity problem. Um, and I think that's a problem in terms of what comes out in the therapy room and how people open up. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't feel like their therapist is represents them in some way that they could feel like could identify with them, that can deal with these issues, they're not as likely to bring them up. And that's one of my big concerns, um, you know, and how do we 
both make our field more diverse, <laughs> first of all, you know, and in psychology as well as in corporations and in all these different settings. And how do we get rid of the stigma um, around, you know, um, mental health in general for for everybody, but particularly in the Black community. And I, you know, I see that that's a big part of the mission that you all are trying to do. Yes. Um... It's a huge task, but we're up for it. I think um, <laughs> uh, stigma is huge. Like you said, it's huge in mental health in general. And then we think about additional barriers that are factors that contribute to stigma being amplified in communities of color. Um, and I feel like our mission is really like, how do we normalize mental health so that we can break down that stigma in multiple ways. And so first we use ourselves, right? Like you have four black clinical psychologists blasted on this site because quite often you hear, oh, I didn't know there were black psychologists. And it's like, yes, there are. But being able to see, like if you see someone who looks like you, who talks like you, who can relate to you in a different way, does that help you feel a little more comfortable just coming and getting the information, right? right. Um, and then from there, we have information that we feel meets or speaks to mental health in the Black community. So, you know, things are changing now, but just two, three years ago, if you wanted to search for um, depression in Black women or how does it look in Black men, which is very different than what the DSM says, right? Um, even with anxiety, a lot of times we are doing these screener measures and or my job and i'm like this is not how you and their scores are low and it's like because you're not experiencing anxiety like this your anxiety is very physical if i say are you having stomach issues or you know do you feel nervous sometimes then those things speak to the differences in how communities of color may experience or communicate their mental health issues and so we created it we have uh, fact sheets and on what different mental uh, illnesses are, what are some, you know, wellness strategies that you may find helpful. We tap into, we know that the church is a huge part of the Black community. How do we highlight that and make it so that it feels okay to pray and go to therapy and to seek both places? We know that the um, beauty salons or barbershops are places well, where a lot of black people may feel comfortable opening up. And so we were intentional about how do we spotlight people from like, how do we spotlight a hairstylist or a barber and have them speak about health and wellness so that when someone comes to our site, it's like, oh, OK. So these are the little chunks that we're using to like normalize mental health. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you think, Danielle? I was going to add to that before you went to the next nugget um, is the social media platform. I think that's a really big way in which we really try to normalize so many aspects of mental health. So we have different themes that we follow each week and we just try to post information that we know from just our research or our clinical background and put it in everyday language and put it in everyday terms and make it digestible. So. I, I mean, even in our own process of developing Black women wellness as an academic, I've even had to work on how much I maybe think in very academic terms and how, you know, the average person isn't thinking like that or isn't speaking like that. And that can create the disconnect. I make a joke all the time that if I wasn't a, a provider, I feel like it's alphabet soup after people's name. Like, what is an M the PhD versus an MD versus an LMF? At, like at all the different LCSW, all the things, right? And I feel like for a lay person, we like that can naturally get in the way of like, I, that's too many steps. I have to think too hard about parts of that. And I'm not going to take those next steps forward. So our goal is to just make some of the process easier. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we're very conscious of the barriers that exist in regard to even seeking treatment. And while stigma is a big one, there's a ton of others. And so when we think about mistrust from the community, when we think about financial barriers, when we think about ease and schedule, even just finding a provider that looks like you, or even living in a city where maybe you can't find a provider that looks like you, but how do I find a culturally competent provider that I feel that I don't have to do so much work when I walk into the room to explain all the things? Mm -hmm. um, like those things all play into it. And I also want to make the 
um, point that while Data talks about, uh, you know, that rapport that you build being the like a major part of whether or not treatment goes well or not, I think it's important for people to know what works for them. So I have some clients that are like, I really want a patient, I mean, a provider that looks like me. That's important to me. I have some that maybe are like, you know what, I'm too connected within this community. I don't want anybody that knows me in whatever way. And I don't want anybody that, that is from my background. And so they, they have to be intentional about that pursuit. But then they don't want to also go to a provider that doesn't look like them. And then they have to spend the first four to six weeks explaining so many things that, you know, if it was, you know, work done on both sides, they wouldn't have to. And so I think all those pieces are important to consider when we're talking about stigma and like being open about, you know, what is really driving people to or from something. And I'm a believer if we know things are happening, like I'm just like, if we're looking at the data and we see these disparities, I think as a system, it's our responsibility to meet the patient where they are. Because we say that in therapy all the time. Like you can't push somebody if they're really not ready. So if I have to meet you where you are individually, as a community, I definitely need to meet you where you are. And so I hope that that is the what our work does and that it represents people. I mean, not even just on a racial level, I think too, just age-wise, sometimes people are like, You're you're a psychologist, like you, you, you're a doctor. And I'm like, yeah, like this is what a psychologist looks like or a doctor looks like, whatever. And so I think even dispelling some of those myths are important in the process so people know they have options. But then I think as a field, we have to do better at actually intentionally training people who are diverse, right? So that they they can actually have a range of options of who can mm -hmm. provide help. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I, I really um, resonate with that idea of speaking to people in terms of, you know, not talking uh, in psychological jargon, you know, not thinking that we know what what they're looking for or what they want as an outcome, by the way. You know, what is their goal in therapy? You know? And part of our website, Psych Alive, why we we used to have a website for the for professionals and we still do, but we really wanted to translate lots of good psychological information that was evidence-based to the general public, you know, make it accessible to people. And I see that's what you're doing as well. And, and you know, making uh, it very accessible to the black community, especially, which is really important. And, you know, like you said, representing that on your website, this is who we are. You know, these are people, you know, I'm a psychologist. This is, you know, what a psychologist looks like. And I think, and here's how you could feel, how you could feel comfortable, you know, and feel like this might speak to you. And um, I think that's so important. And, and I think, you know, diversity training as it used to be was very much kind of stereotypes, you know, this kind of person needs this or this kind of person needs that. No, it's just so, in, it's so much more nuanced and individual than that. Um, well, I think we need to educate ourselves completely, you know, and, but we need to educate ourselves about the nuances and about the complications, not, you were talking about living in the North versus living in the South. I mean, you know, there are different realities for people where they grew up, where they find themselves residing now, what's the atmosphere where they live, you know? Um, and how do you translate all those, you know, but I think being open to all those things and taking all those things into account, so important. Right. One of the things that, um, we both went to G uh, George Washington University, um, and we both had the same advisor, uh, even <laughs> though we were at different times, but, uh, my cohort was one of the first, uh, we were the first cohort where they had like a clinical psychology, but like a community focus. So we were like the, um, pilot class but the beautiful part about that process and that training and I'm glad that we had that community focus is that we always were forced to think about how does this look you know you're thinking about all of these different pieces of a person and it doesn't matter and we're not just saying like only do this for black people but for any person like how does this fit as an individual, as you know, in the different systems that they're a part of. So what does it look like in a school setting? What does it look like in their community? What does it look like in their home, in their job? And so that's always how my mind sort of works. Like, even if I don't have the expertise, I'm going to ask the questions because I really care about you and I want to see some actual change from you. So the more I know about you, the more I can think about these bigger picture things that are happening around you, um, then we can also think about how do we help you deal with that and how do we help you navigate how it impacts you. So that was one of the things like recently, 
as we're having these conversations, I'm realizing, oh, all trainings were not like this. There are some people who just aren't comfortable having those conversations. And we would have to do like presentations both within our lab, within our classes or the department. And someone was always asking the question, how does this apply? How are you going to use that in a therapy room? How, and it forced you to think about that. And so I think I got so used to that being the way that I just assumed like, oh, everybody is assessing this, <laughs> talking about this in therapy. And it may not be the case. <laughs> I know it's not the case. Or even, or even being trained, right? Like being trained to think in this way. Because I think our program, like you said, was so big on context. Like everything was like, you have to contextually place that in order to say that thing for real, right? Because it, it can mm -hmm. change depending mm -hmm. on context. So I definitely agree with that. And I think when we think about diversity training, how you described it historically and even sometimes, unfortunately, presently, um, it can be very limited to maybe a week out of a set of curriculum or a month, like it's February or it's July or it's, you know, it's minority mental health month for July, whatever, like whatever the thing is, um, I feel like we see that emphasis, but I think the real power when we talk about diversity and we talk about training and we talk about understanding context is about the integration, right? Like how do I legitimately not think of diversity as this additional committee or this add-on to anything that I do, but it's going to be integrated throughout everything we do. And when it's not, that's that's it's not just like this tag on we need to do or throw something in or a slide that says, see, this is diverse population. But like, how do we literally bring that into our conversations and into our context and into what we value? Like, how do we systematically value that in a particular way? I think that's really important uh, for the future of our field. Uh, and just the intentionality about how do we train diverse groups? Because even when we think about um, when we think about uh, just who you see in the in the therapy room, right? We know that a lot of times certain patient populations will come in way later. So when problems are far more severe, so we may never even see a subset of people. And if you think about a community having such stigma around seeking treatment, they don't even get exposure to that as a potential career option in the future, right? So you kind of I know a lot of times people tend to be interested in what they've been exposed to, right? And if you don't even have exposure on the patient population level, how do we expect to get providers, right, to have this, this distinct interest in this field? So I think it has to be so intentional on how do we train diverse groups of people. And I think, you know, Black Men Wellness, we have a national training program that we're really proud of. And that's been, you know, like our, our baby in a lot of ways because the only way we i've gotten where i've gotten and many of us is through the mentorship and training of others before but it was it's like someone reaching out to me and saying what well, i'm going to help you in a very particular way because i didn't have other options for what that looked like yeah 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 i think it's so important and the curiosity of really getting to know the person that's sitting in front of us you were talking about like okay so who is this person and what and if i don't know how do i learn you know and what's the right questions to ask and you know. Yeah, that um, was exactly what one of my supervisors told me in grad school. She's like, you just have to be curious, you know? She's like, if you're curious, you're naturally asked questions and like want to know more about that person. So I'm like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I think and it takes that personality of being curious. And you know, I, I the, the clinicians that worry me are the most the most are the ones who think they know. <laughs> you know, and they're very sure about all they know. <laughs> you know, I'm like being, that way about people, okay. providers especially, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true too. Yeah, it's about people in general. You're right. Um, let's see. Um, We have some questions from Instagram. Um, we reached out on our social media uh, in preparation for this. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the person said, I, I, I've read a little bit about intergenerational trauma and I'd love to hear you talk about the intergenerational trauma of racism. I imagine seeing the videos, especially recently is re-traumatizing a lot of people, but you know, just the whole intergenerational levels of trauma. <sighs> I mean, it's a big question, I obviously, not a little question. question. I feel like Danielle and I, we've been talking about this a lot because situations like this often force you to like think about it in a different way. Um, 
and you know it's there, but you know, just to like, you're like seeing it happen. And so when we're thinking about intergenerational trauma as it relates to uh, racism, discrimination, police brutality, the killing of black people by police and things of that nature, I think, you know, it all stems back to the history of black people in America, right? And so knowing we had history before that, but even, or I guess even we can think about starting from the capture in different countries in Africa and, you know, even that process and coming through the mid-Atlantic and here, right? So all of that entire experience is trauma. You think right. about being captured in somewhere that you feel safe, being placed on the ship in unlivable conditions, being placed in this foreign land, and then being forced into labor, being forced into a new religion, being forced away from your family. And I say all of this because this is the context and the beginning of a lot of the intergenerational trauma that we see. So we know that these things are passed down and you're thinking about hundreds of years of this happening and almost just thinking about it like on a continuum, right? So it was slavery, the enslavement of black people in America. And then you're thinking about the separation of family. You're thinking about the hard labor. You're thinking about the abuse. You're thinking about the lynchings. And I equate, this is just a side note, but I equate the continuous replay of the killing of black people by police as the equivalent of a lynching. Like people sitting around watching it and it has the same messaging, right? Yeah. Um, and then you go into these different eras of like fighting for freedom, escaping slavery, fighting to be educated, fighting to learn who you are, dealing with Jim Crow era, dealing with I'm going to build this community and we're going to be safe and we're going to change things and having people bomb your whole community. And every time you're fighting someone making it harder, they're changing the standards, they're beating you down, you're fighting just to say, I should vote. Like some of this stuff just sounds ridiculous if you really think about it. Like we're gonna fight to have equal education. And truth be told, we're still fighting for equal education, but all contexts, these are the things that you're passing down from generation to generation. We know that it impacts how you, um, how you parent, Right. So even if we're it, let's think, let's just even genetically is being passed down. But we know that even in the behaviors of how you parent, of how you um, teach your children to live in the world, how you cope, like it's all being passed down um, through almost like a trauma lens. So for a lot of people, you're not even living to. And this is something I've been paying a lot of attention to recently. You're not even living to live and to be happier and to thrive, you're in survival mode all the time. That's not living. You're always waiting for something to happen or in preparation of that. And so that is sort of like the lens of all of it is that you're not safe. How do we keep you safe? How do we keep you close? You know, I think a lot of times about how I was parented, how I now parent, and some of the fears that may not have been my direct experiences, but were certainly passed down to me. And as for as much as I don't want to pass it on to my daughter, I'm like, well, if it helped me survive. So thinking about how do you feel about your children being away from you? How do you feel about sleepovers? How do you feel about what school they go to or the events they go to? Because all of these things are also under the umbrella of, are they safe? Will someone take them from me? Will they be harmed? Will someone misjudge them because of the color of their skin or something of that nature? So I just feel like it's a long history. We know that they've looked in other um, populations and looked at trauma and how it's impacted for generations following. And so we also have to acknowledge that this is the truth for many Black people in America. Yeah, I think you did such an excellent job really detailing and laying out what pieces of the journey look like and how those things are examples of trauma that while we know like genetically impact us, but we also know just from individual experiences, right? So like uh, in one, one exercise we sometimes do in family systems work, 
is this idea of this genogram, right? And a genogram is literally this idea of just having this family tree, but you're not just saying who's related to who, you're saying how people are related to each other. You're saying how, uh, what, what types of mental health or health experiences these people, like your, people in your family had. And before you can do that with another family, it was in my training, we had to do it for ourselves, right? And in that process, I was able to quickly see how experiences with aspects of Jim Crow really can, can corner families or corner individuals into not being able to rely on what the average person was able to rely on for safety, support, whatever. And a lot of things had to be done internally, right? And thinking about, you know, how do people cope with all of this, right? So we see high rates of health problems, right? Like the foods they're eating, the substances they're using, the behavior they're engaging in to, to be well the best they can, right? Like those things also transmit an impact in, in carry on, right? And I think when I was able to do that for myself, I was like, wow, this is just, you know, one generation back my dad was born in 1948. It's his birthday today. He's 72. And then one generation further, my grandmother had him um, when she was 16. So she was what? So she's like 88 now. And I, and I can see all the things that just impacted them individually that they had to push forward and, and try to persevere through. And then it kind of creates some of these set, these labels that we, we talk about, like the strong black woman or, you know, we got to just keep pushing through because we have been so resilient. It doesn't always make space for being human, which is like, yeah, I'm resilient, but I'm tired and I'm human and I'm not stronger than everybody else. I just get, I just have to deal with more than everybody else. And I think considering, you know, that individual contextual, how does that all relate just from a personal level was, was allowed me to really have a better understanding of the historical context in which, you know, I was really sitting in. And I had one class when I was at um, an undergrad in the University of Michigan. And I remember just the, like it was a it was an Afro African American studies class, and I remember it was a poem that really detailed some of the behaviors that were done to Black people during the time. And I think the one that was so vivid for me was um, a slave master tying a horse, two different horses, to a individual's body and forcing them to run in opposite direction to literally pull this this person's body. And like when I think about that, and I read that, I was just like, wow the amount we have really had to endure. Like we say slavery, but we don't really talk about what that actually looked like, right? Like we can say the word slavery and we like, oh, we know about that thing that happened. It's like, no, that wasn't a small thing that happened. That was a very big set of things that happened over and over and over again. And we know that this country allowed that to happen. The knowledge of that in and of itself mm -hmm. threatened safety. You know what I mean? So I think really understanding the context and the details of it are so important for us when we talk about your generational trauma. Right. And I, I think, like you said, just a word like slavery just doesn't describe the individual abuses and traumas and inhumane behavior and torture of a human being. Um, right. Um, yeah. You know, that we're that we're done under the name of that, you know, which it takes away some of the horror to use just a word, but it doesn't really give reflect it fully, like you said. And, you know, like you said, that that could be done in this country, that this country endorsed it, not only endorsed it, profited from it. Built on it, right? Ultimately. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, yes, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> and that these things are still going on. You know, yes. that it hasn't yeah. exactly, it's not like, okay, that was so long ago. That's not the story anymore. No, there's too much of that story now. No, yeah, exactly. And too, still too much. And that's, you know, um, you know, like we say, oh, lynchings don't happen now, but they do. Yeah. And they did it in the video. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's it's still happening. And that's that's a problem. Um, but yeah, and I think the story of us, you know, of how we came to be who we are, you know, for each of us in becoming a therapist and learning, you know, like you said, doing a genogram, but really thinking about how did all that inform who I am? And mm -hmm. thinking about that for the people we work with as well. Right. You know. Right. Each of those experiences. I know like when you sort of think it through, um, it's like, oh, it's amazing that for where our history is in this country, like this is where we are. And so this is why 
you know, for black people, when people get, when they graduate, we graduate high school or college or graduate school, you know, we're the loudest in the room because each time that happens, you're going directly against what our history was. And you're always reminded, you know, in black communities, we're always taught or a lot of times taught um, you stand on the shoulders of your ancestors and that there is this power in seeing success despite a lot of the challenges that we face. And so being able to get certain positions on a job or being able to start a business, being able to be a psychologist, those are all like, I feel like that is a protest, a revolution. It is a win for all of us, right? And then how each of our life experiences led to where we are and why we chose to be therapists. Um, and especially, you know, I, I tell people all the time, and this is why I mentor and it's why I like probably take on more than I should sometimes with mentoring, but it was like, I didn't have an example. I'm a first generation college student, right? Um, and I didn't meet a psychologist until I got to college. And then I didn't have a mentor until I was like a junior in college. But I recognize that having those examples, having people that you can directly touch and that can guide you can help make your path so much easier. So I feel like I did things sometimes that probably could have been done in an easier way had I had someone helping to guide me through that process. Um, and so that's why part of like with our training, we have both undergrad, graduate students. And this year we had even early career uh, mental health professionals sign up for it. And I think it's our duty to sort of help people also get to where we are. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I always tell like when people come to me and we have different conversations around what are their next steps or mentorship and they're like, oh my God, thank you. How can I repay you? And I'm like, pay it forward. That's how you can repay me. I'm so incredibly grateful for my board of directors of mentors. And just as an undergrad, Dr. Tiffany Griffin, she took me under her wing and she explained to me even the process of a PhD. I don't even think I fully understood what that even looked like or meant. And so I always just encourage my mentees, just pay it forward and help the next generation increase and get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's so important. And, you know, it's overcoming in spite of, but it is, it is tiring, like you said, too, though, you know, this idea that got to be strong all the time, you know, that's, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, and I think that that's why, um, again, if we change systems, we hold people accountable, even in the therapy room, allowing people to just be who they are authentically, so that you don't have to carry this huge burden, or mm -hmm. that you don't have to be strong or that you don't have to carry on all of these things. So Danielle knows I don't let, allow anybody to call me a strong black woman. I am a woman. I am human. You will not make me some superhero because when I need help, I need you to see me as a human and give me help. <laughs> make it easier for me. So, I love yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't make me carry it all. <laughs> like, it, let's it's hear it. Yes, it's, it's too much. Mm -hmm. Too much, yeah. Uh, another question we got from Instagram is, um, uh, when do you suggest parents start to talk to kids about racism and how should they start these conversations? I saw that question. I, I loved it, right? Primarily because I work with kids. And this question comes up a lot. And I think the initial reaction a lot of parents have is that, I don't want to scare my child. I don't want to increase their anxiety. Um, I don't want to give them the parent worries of the world. Uh, and I totally understand that that is the position as a protector, as a provider that you want to sit in with your child. I also think it's important to understand that sometimes we want to be a part of helping our kids make that narrative though, right? So if they're responsible at seven, five, whatever age, to make their own narrative, they're doing it with that developmental level and understanding, right? But when we can get involved in that process with them and join them, then we can have conversations and have an understanding of where they are. So I think the first thing is to really understand what is your child thinking, right? Like what does your child already know? Your child isn't existing in a vacuum, unaware of everything that's going on around them. They're watching you. They're hearing your, your podcast, your news stories. They see the things you talk about with your friends and your partner. And I think it's important to, to not underestimate that. And so I would first begin with some understanding and some discussion beginning 
around what do they what do you think about that what have you heard like as things kind of come up i think there are a ton of resources out there related to different tv programs that you can watch with your child even sesame street put out something recently around how to talk to your kid about race how to talk to them about racism and i think those types of things are really good conversation starters right books around things related to this are really good conversation starters and i think it's important for parents to know it's not this when do I talk to them about racism? I gotta have this talk and then we're done, right? Like it's not a talk, it's it's integrated, right? Like it's happening in the world. So I think it's integrated throughout your experiences with talking with them. And you don't have to feel the pressure of, let's do it all at once, let's do it all today. You can get a temperature feel for what your child has been exposed to or what they're thinking about or what questions they have, and you just start there. And I think it's also important that we don't always think we have to have all the answers, right? we're human we need to model for our kids that we don't always know everything and so if there's something we don't know wow baby that's a really good question mommy's gonna take some time and think about that or i'm gonna look into that a little bit more or maybe you can join me on let what do you think where where can we find some of this information or these answers and and bring your child along on the journey i think there's also once you know COVID passes there's other creative ways that you take like what are museums you can visit what are projects you can have as like a family project to do um, related to important milestones or key things that are in your city. I think there's so many ways that you can have conversations about race and racism because it's happening, right? And so I think integrating, you know, your child in, in a developmentally appropriate way, right? Uh, we want to make sure that they understand from their, their vantage point. And we don't want to increase their worry, but we want to be honest. And if we were to sit and say, oh, we're all just human, it's not, no differences. I think that really undervalues, um, you know, the unique, the, the, the beauty of uniqueness and difference and celebrating diversity. And I think if we can integrate that and really send that message across all things, I think kids will really pick that up. I think that's important. I like what you said about it being an evolving conversation too, because as kids have experiences, whether they witness things or have things directly up and impact them, they're gonna have more questions, right? Or it's gonna be a different question or a different set of you know conversations that need to occur you know um if they're in a new setting if they're around different peers if they're watching tv or social media you know and i like also that you said that they're not naive they've heard things or they've seen things you're not starting yeah, to one study said they know like they you know kids are aware of race and racial bias as early as preschool and that's just from a study right we don't that's we don't know about people's anecdotal experiences more broadly but that's young and they can they can identify what's happening and i think kids are smart I, I always think parents think kids know less than what they do maybe because i see a lot of adolescents that are trying to keep things away from their parents so <laughs> as you <laughs> sit in that space you're like mm -mm, i think they know more than we probably let on to believe they do mm -hmm. yeah i think that's really important and and you know so asking the questions and seeing what they know and and then letting the questions evolve and creating a safe atmosphere so as things as they experience things they could keep having those conversations you know or have them in new ways mm -hmm. yeah i sometimes think too about people more broadly who can be mentors to them outside of their family too sometimes or you know maybe it's an aunt or an uncle or maybe it's a family friend who might be knows more about that you know or could help with this part of it or you know I right, so know. it I feel like it's only the responsibility of the parent and that way it's sort of extended and then you're able to get different perspectives education and all of that yeah yeah i think that that's helpful um you know the bigger i think we all need a bigger family <laughs> to support us you know yeah. uh, when raising kids especially right you know? exactly. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, a lot of complexities to that. Um, I wondered if, if either of you had anything else you'd like to share, particularly related to what we've been talking about or that maybe we left out of this conversation that should be here. I don't know, I guess it's just in general, like um, for every, for all people, you know, being mindful of how different events impact your mental health. And, um, Danielle, what is the word you use? Do you like your body check in, like sort of check in with yourself and be mindful of how it's impacting you. A lot of times we deal with stress and it's not until it either gets really bad or like when we're almost through it and it's like, oh, wait, I'm not sleeping the way that I normally would. My sleep cycle is off. I'm eating more or less than I normally would. I'm not 
doing the activities I normally do, or I'm just feeling this heightened sense of stress. So I think it's always important to sort of monitor that, be in tune with yourself, and then also be in tune with what are those things that help you feel grounded, that help you to de-stress, that help you to feel happier, who are the people that help you feel more fulfilled, um, and how do you sort of incorporate all of that into your life? Yeah, I like that a lot. And I would just kind of re-emphasize re some of the things we talked about related to just kind of being aware of like what work is there still to be done, right? And like thinking, like I would encourage people to take time to really reflect like what are the systems that you're a part of and how can you influence them in ways that are good for all people in regard to the therapy context or, you know, or just your work environment, whatever the case that may be. Um, and to really be thoughtful about how you're showing up for your patient populations and, you know, really wanting to let you know that Black mental wellness is a resource in that. A lot of our um, fact sheets, we really like to just be easy one pagers that or a few pages that people can just print out for some of their patient populations. So we want you to know that that free resource is there. Uh, and I think just this largely this larger idea of what Nicole said earlier of like, being authentic and like authentically being able to show up into particular spaces I think is so important so you know just to self-check are you able to do that and are you allowing and making space for others to also be able to do that well um and it kind of just really uh strikes a chord for me when I think about we we, we launched a, a shirt collection called authentically me that really represents that for us where we all put uh sayings on our shirt that really represented some aspect of our own journey with wellness and what was important about the work that we were doing and why we were doing it. And so those can be found on our website as well. Yes, I have my order in. I was really impressed with those when oh, I found you. We appreciate <laughs> the support. What? I said, well, thank you. We appreciate the support. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. No, I thought that it's really cool. And I also like, I mean, the thing about a t-shirt is you're also, it's, I think that's part of the de-stigma right there, you know, like, yes, Mental health issues are there. We deal with them. We, you know, it's okay to talk about them. It invites a conversation in a way. Yes, and that's exactly, that's exactly what we wanted. And to be able to share a part of us so that again, we're taking down those barriers. And it's like, just because I'm a psychologist doesn't mean I haven't faced some challenges or adversities, or I haven't had difficult moments on this mental health journey. And so if you hear that and see it and we talk about it, maybe that's another way of destigmatizing mental health because we're using ourselves to say, hey, we've had some issues too. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love them. I know it happens to me where Kyle will say, you know, I know you've never felt anxious like this. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> no, not quite. Not, not the truth. Let's, you know, and, you know, that we're all human. And, I, you know, I think sometimes it's important to bring, to show up as a human being, not just as a professional in with our clients, because they really do need another human being. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We agree. Well, thank you. This has been great. And I really just feel like there's so much uh, consilience and and value in what you guys are bringing to the table with, you know, it fits so well with what we're trying to do. I'm just really thrilled. So to have met you. Thank, thank you. you for having yes. us. Yes, okay. likewise. Oh, and I look forward to your webinar that you're going to be doing. We should hey. let people know about that too, so that they can do that. Um, and that's going to be uh, next month. And uh, that will be available to people too. And Want to see a little bit about that or it'll be later this month actually right, that's right, that's right. Like, already in july i'm sorry <laughs> it's i'm in lockdown so this is just like you know it's gotten lost <laughs> yeah so we really just wanted to be able to um put out a webinar that was specific to developing strategies for how do you talk about race experiences of discrimination and racism um within the in the therapy room and thinking through uh what are some good things for providers to know in that space. Nicole, did you wanna add anything additional? Yeah, I think um, you summed it up, but being able to one, talk about it and identify it and then coming up with what are some of those strategies. So even what you were saying earlier about it's a continual conversation and it looks very different, you know, if you're speaking with, 
a five-year-old and a 17-year-old? And how do you have those conversations? Um, I was thinking of this too, even, you know, not just parents and family members and things like that, but if you're thinking about different spaces where you may interact and engage with youth, so in mentoring environments or teachers or things like that, these conversations and questions will be coming up. And so we want people to feel feel comfortable having the discussion, even if it's just sometimes just kids just want a sounding board, honestly. But if you can be that and feel comfortable in it, we'll, we're going to um, provide some strategies and a space to talk about it. So we look forward to it. We love talking about this, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> look forward to the webinar and we'll have a question and answer section. So we love talking to people. Again, we love talking. Um, and so it'll be great. Yes. And I guess if people submit questions, then we can make sure to address those types of things in the webinar. Sure. We will let you know and if you have questions come in. Questions yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I know it I know it captured me. I was like, oh yes, I'm I'm going to this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyhow, I'm very excited um, for the collaboration. So thank you so much for being here today. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.